Hi, I'm Jeff Glor from CBS Saturday Morning. Welcome to The Dish. It can be sweet, it can be sour, it can certainly be spicy. Today we're talking all about Chinese cuisine. We visit an iconic spot in New York City's Chinatown that's been serving up dim sum for more than 100 years. Then we visit a high-end Toronto restaurant offering an authentic menu inspired by the rich, diverse flavors from across China's provinces. But we begin with a chef famous for Chinese takeout. Gong Lin Wang has written several cookbooks for making popular favorites at home, full of recipes from his family's own Chinese restaurants. MTS Taib steps in as sous chef in Wang's home. For Gong Lin Wang, there's no place he'd rather be than in the kitchen. There are three flavors in Cantonese cooking, which are garlic, ginger, spring onion. He cooks in his newly remodeled home, in the very same building his parents ran their Cantonese-style restaurant back in the late 1970s. For the British city of Leicester, it introduced locals to flavors from the Far East, part of a tradition that started with his grandfather, who opened his own Chinese restaurant in the area nearly two decades earlier. For the chef and cookbook author, these are the tastes of home, including his personal favorite, spring rolls, or what his parents had on their menus as pancake rolls. So, any idea why these are called pancake rolls in the UK and egg rolls in the US? I had no idea. I've got no idea either. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking you. <laughs> so. For one, along with his brother and sister, helping out in the kitchen was a fact of life while growing up. But we actually used to live upstairs as children. But that just meant we were on tap or on hand all the time. So when mum and dad got busy downstairs, it literally was, you know, someone would run up and get us. Or my dad actually had an internal phone system installed in every <laughs> single room. So if you're upstairs so watching TV, it did, Yeah, it didn't down. matter which room you were in, the phone rang, we're busy downstairs, come and help. Wow. So we're going to take a one ton oh, wrap up. Okay. Um, okay. Since right. then, do, little has changed. Our, we were called on to help too, right, right, okay, starting so off left, making one tons. So I just pinched them together. Like so. Or nearly. <laughs> That's your first attempt, though. There isn't you go. It? So yeah, let's just say I'm not a natural one ton maker. <laughs> so you just take the corner, yep. fold it over. To filling like spring roll wrappers with a mixture of carrot, Napa cabbage, bean sprouts, and water chestnuts. And I'm guessing this is your first spring roll wrap. It is. How well did done. you know? Is now, it that obvious? It's better than your one ton wrapping. <laughs> <laughs> so, I <think> so. <laughs> Perfect. Now that is there what we go. call a spring roll. That's better than mine. That's pretty good. I'm pretty <laughs> proud of that. That's great. Juan is the author of several cookbooks, but a life in the kitchen isn't something he always wanted. He left home in his 20s to spend his days learning kung fu and his nights working as a bouncer at nightclubs. Just throwing guys out and of bars. Yeah, and I literally <laughs> used to bounce people out of the nightclub. Kind of and I loved every minute of it. Going on to open his own martial arts school, where his love of teaching and food led him back to what he does best. And I thought, well, you know what? I can cook. And, I, and I've got all these recipes that we used and used to cook, you know, cook in, the, in the restaurant. Let's teach people how to cook the food, not only the food that we were eating, but the food you were eating every time you went to a good Cantonese or Chinese takeaway or takeout. Yeah. My Kung Po king prawns. So Juan started posting recipes online of the takeout classics he learned to cook as a child. Very, very, very simple sesame seed prawn toast. Now, if you like it saucy, add more salt. Earning him a loyal following that led to regular appearances on national TV. Pork, sugar, and an eight-part series for Amazon. There seems to be this undercurrent of nostalgia to what you do. Why do you think it connects with people in that way? So when I wrote my first book, I, I listened to music that we listened to when I was working in the restaurant in the 1980s. And it helped me remember the feelings that I had when I was cooking or eating those dishes. I remember billows of smoke coming off the hot plates when we served the OK beef yeah. or the Canton beef. They're trying to recreate moments with their own family when they sat around a, a table eating a Chinese takeout or in a restaurant much like this one used to be. Exactly. But for us, he cooked his all-time favorites, <laughs> those spring rolls. Mm. The crunch, the flavors, the freshness, perfect. Good. Good. I'm pleased. Kung Pao chicken. Is that hitting the spot? No, that hits the spot. 
Fry it with a cashew nut now, mm. and you're getting that creaminess coming through. So you've got this sensation, yeah. and your mouth kind of like goes. <laughs> Char siu pork and a classic chow mein. Another all time favorite. Mm. You cannot go to a takeaway and not have chow mein. No, definitely not. And the key to cooking really nice chow mein is to let it burn a little bit. Now, burn. That, that sounds crazy, but adding that charred flavor just adds that extra element of texture and flavor. All made with ingredients that can be found in nearly any grocery store, anywhere. Some could argue this is not authentic. What do you say to that? It's as authentic as you ate 30 years ago. It's as authentic as I ate 45 years ago. So why is it not authentic? Just because, it, you know, at the end of the day, every single dish that we eat now has evolved from somewhere. And for Gokhlin Wan, that evolution has taken place here in the house where it all began. Two things I can do, right. and that's cook and kick. I'm, yeah, and kick. I'm the original Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> Dumplings in Kung Fu. Dumplings in Kung Fu. Up next, dim sum, anyone? We'll taste the shareable fare from the oldest restaurant in New York City's Chinatown when we come back. In New York City's Chinatown sits Nam Wa Tea Parlor, a dim sum spot that's been cooking up their signature egg rolls, dumplings, and more for more than 100 years. Vladimir Dutier took a trip to downtown Manhattan to learn more about the historic restaurant and the cookbook featuring their famous recipes. These are some of the top favorites in our restaurant. Our first one is the shrimp and snow pea leaf dumping. To truly appreciate Namwa's food, you have to appreciate Namwa's rich history. The food that we serve is actually very traditional. It's stuff that I've had as a kid, or my parents have had as a kid. Since 1920, Namwa Tea Parlor in New York's Chinatown has become an institution. Owner Wilson Tang. Hospitality is in my DNA. It is what my dad and my uncles have done uh, when they first came to America as immigrants. It's the quintessential story of the American dream. Tang's uncle, Uncle Wally, worked his way up from dishwasher to cook to waiter to eventually owning Namwa and ran it for almost 50 years. Meanwhile, Tang pursued a high-flying career in finance. You exemplify in many ways what all of us who are first-generation Americans sort of exemplify to our families, right? I did follow that path of, you know, going to school, getting good grades, and, you know, having my stint in finance. But I think at the end of the day, um, this was my calling. If I didn't do it, who would do it? Over the years, Namwa, much like New York's Chinatown, has endured enormous challenges, from 9-11 to a global pandemic. But through it all, Chinatown has survived and continued to thrive. I think restaurants in Chinatown had always been the underdog. We have a lot of grit and a lot of heart. And what better way to celebrate and showcase that spirit than to write a cookbook, marking the restaurant's 100-year journey. I wanted something that really talks about the neighborhood and the mom and pop businesses that are still around. From the local tea guru, to the fish whisperer, to the grocery store goddess, the book is an ode to a community that is close-knit and resilient. Hey, Mr. Lee. As we found out quickly while walking the streets of Chinatown. You're semi-retired? Yeah, I try to retire. But, you know, I, I gotta survive, you know? Next stop, Fong An, a local tofu shop where we found Chef Paul Ang making a fresh batch of grass jelly. Ang revived his family business of over 80 years with new twists to traditional recipes. We have a ginger rice cake. We like ginger. We like the brown rice cake. Let's put them together. Eggplant and shrimp uh, on this one. This yeah. is, you know, very classic. Back at Namwa, some more Tang family classics for me to chow down. This is also a fan favorite. And last but not least um, is our rice rolls. This is basically rice that's been broken down into a liquid and then re-steamed uh, on a tray. And what is dim sum without some hot tea? Black tea with chrysanthemum flowers in it. Cheers to yeah. you. Cheers to you. Chinese food is also popular across the pond. Nestled in the English Midlands, Chef Andrew Wong's eatery, A Wong, boasts two Michelin stars. 
It's also in the same location as his late father's restaurant, though Wong doubts his dad would be impressed he followed in his footsteps. MTS Tayeb explains. Put a little bit in, in a box, each one. There is precision, and then there is Andrew Wong's precision. The British-born Chinese chef channels 3,000 years of Chinese cooking technique into his 21st century innovations. His restaurant, A. Wong, won its first Michelin star in 2017. Roger, why do we have a knife and fork on the table? Are we, are we uh, <laughs> what, what are we trying to say about myself say and my guest? <laughs> we met up to discuss his life, career, and what inspires uh, him. Let's start from the beginning. Who's Andrew Wong? I was born in London. And my parents, my, my father's side of the family is from Sichuan, and my mother was, um, is from Hong Kong. And to tell you the truth, I, I never imagined I would become a chef. Being a chef isn't exactly the, 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 the occupation of choice. No, uh, not for, for the child of immigrants. For, for the children of immigrants, exactly. Wong's family business was in restaurants, but his parents wanted him to get an education. So, so I, I initially studied chemistry at Oxford. I mean, your parents must have been pretty happy about that. Why right until I got kicked out. Why? Um, well, I had, I had quite a poor attendance record. <laughs> Switching to anthropology, Wong was at the London School of Economics when his father, who had run the family restaurant for years, suddenly died. When my father passed away, it was, um, it was a realisation that I had to, had to grow up and I had to grow up fast. That restaurant is now the location of his own eatery, named after his parents, Albert and Annie. And I remember for the first years that I was a chef, my parent, my, my mum didn't want to tell people that I was, I was good. I was like, oh, he's still deciding whether he wants to go to <laughs> law school. But actually she was, she's been a great, great support for me. I mean, she's the first one to, to tell me when I'm doing things wrong. She does. Obviously always, right? <laughs> always. Um, for Michelin star always, judges, there's like, little the chef can do wrong. It's, it's His really take on the Cantonese brunch time staple dim sum, which translates as touching heart, is an assortment of small plates, steamed, savory, and fried. I'm staring at what looks like grass <laughs> and what look like mushrooms. It looks like, it? So it's a bun. It's, okay. it's, it's a steamed bun. It's a steamed bun. Inside is mushrooms. Okay. Um, and again, it's just one. It's just to be playful. You know, dim sum yeah. is meant to be playful. Yeah. You know, people are meant to sit around the table, have a laugh. Wong takes even the humblest of ingredients and supercharges them with flavor. I have my eye on what looks like a seashell. Um, the chicken wing. It's a chicken wing. The chicken wing. So it's a it's a, a chicken wing that's been marinated in fermented bean curd. Wow, um, and what's that on top of it? It's uh, basically diced up snail with ginger and garlic and chili. Okay, so I'll take that. But okay. there are two bones in that wing. There are, okay, because, so it's like a proper yeah. chicken wing. Yeah, because it's like sacrilege to, to be removing <laughs> bones from a chicken wing in Chinese culture. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like this really represents you as a British-born Chinese person? You know, I'm not an expert on Chinese food, but I. I'd like to think that I'm aspiring to be an expert on my Chinese food and the Chinese food that we serve at A Wong. Mm. Um, and that's real, all I can really answer for um, as a chef and as, as someone who has come from um, a background of Chineseness within an international city. Collaborating with food anthropologist Dr. Mukta Das, Wong frequently travels to China to explore Chinese food history, recipes, and ingredients but he hasn't forgotten the community he grew up with in London. You've said this before, this is your dad's restaurant. It's now yours. It's doing phenomenally well. Uh, what do you think your dad would have made of all of this? Um, that's, a, <laughs> that, that's a hard one. Because um, he would have been proud of what we've achieved. You just wouldn't but, say it. But no, but he would not have been proud for the journey it took to get here. Um, because he much would have preferred me to be a doctor. Um, Even still, with two Michelin stars. I think so. After the break, the diverse dishes of a Toronto hotspot. Thirty-one-year-old chef David Schwartz won the Michelin Guide's 2023 Toronto Young Chef Award. The menu at his acclaimed and ambitious restaurant, Mimi Chinese, reflect his creativity and love for the cuisine. Brooke Silva Braga takes a bite. 
Go in with the spoon, actually. Get a little bit of the broth. David Schwartz is certain what you should want. You eat this one with your hands. Whether you yeah. knew Wait, you wanted it or not. Oh, Take wow. a little of the rice, oh, wow. put it in your bowl. From the food to the vessel. Bowl or plate? Bowl. That's a good question as well. To the way your eyes adjust as you step into his restaurant. But you told me the number one complaint is people say it's too dark. And uh, <laughs> people say it's too dark. For us, it's perfect. If Mimi Chinese is perfect, the glowing reviews suggest it's close, it's because low-key partner and friend Braden Chung has managed to help harness Schwartz's obsessive sense for perfection. People assume there's like a box we keep in the wall here and I just open the box at the end of the night, I go inside in the morning, somebody lets me out. Yeah. <laughs> there's a reason that we work well together and that we've been friends for this long. Right. Oh, but yeah. You balance each other out. I think so. I think so. I hope so. <laughs> Mimi Chinese is also a balance. Dishes aiming for the authenticity of a Chengdu street corner served in an upscale Toronto dining room. Four piece gift turn up to 501. Some potential investors recoiled, fearing it would be too Chinese for Western diners and not Chinese enough for those who grew up on chashu pork. This is a three day process. Or whole fish. And inside is actually an aged tangerine peel. More audacious still, the restaurant wouldn't focus on one Chinese food tradition. Chicken with Sichuan peppercorn. Say Sichuan food or Cantonese. Once you deep fry it, it gets like this glass texture. But instead deliver dishes from across China. As you'll notice, your mouth will be like tingling. A bit like the same restaurant serving Southern barbecue in New England clam chowder. Even Schwartz credits some of their success to the blind confidence of youth. How old are you? 28. 28. 31, actually. He'll take on things that I'm like, are you sure? And he'll be like, let's do it. We're going to make the uh, rice noodle rolls. One of those leaps was hiring Chung as head right, chef. So okay, and you're controlling it with your knee. With your knee. So this controls yeah, okay. the fire. Though he grew up eating his family's native Cantonese food, most of his own cooking experience was in high-end Western kitchens. In Canada, at least, you know, the, the standard, the gold standard is European, French, maybe Italian restaurants. And those were the restaurants you wanted to work in? When I was younger, yes. It was like, okay, well, if they're number one, I want to work for them. He also trained at Michelin-starred restaurants in Japan. And at Mimi, yeah. melds all that fine dining sensibility with old school technique. Do, do you have any trouble your first time doing this? First time was a nightmare. I didn't know what I was doing. How long does it take to learn? Uh, many, many, many hundreds of hours. Oh. The reward is the subtle, unique wake flavor of stir-fried rice noodles. There's just that little bit of char as like this different kind of flavor. Mm -hmm. So I actually live around the corner. Okay. Um, and I've eaten at probably every single place in Chinatown. Maybe ironically, it's Schwartz, a Jewish kid from the Toronto suburbs okay. who's long been consumed with Chinese cooking. I spend all of my off time eating at these places. I still do, it's like all that I do. His dad led weekly trips to spots like King's Noodle, and when Schwartz lost his mom at age 12, just as his older sisters left the house, the lunches with dad took on added meaning. For a good chunk of my life, yeah, it was my dad and I. We would go out for dim sum every Sunday, and he would, and still will, eat absolutely anything. So tripe, chicken feet, tendon, like, all of those things were, I was exposed to really early on, and now they're my favorite textures and, and things to eat. Convincing others to embrace those cuts. I don't want, do I want this? I, I want like this. it. Can be more of a challenge. So we have a dish called husband and wife beef, we use shank, tripe, and tendon. It's like a great way to trick people into eating <laughs> tripe and tendon who otherwise wouldn't. Were you concerned at all when you put it on? I was, actually. When we opened, I didn't put the tripe and tendon on the actual menu. I just put like three kinds of beef or something. Oh, um, and then we changed it, and it worked out really well. <laughs> is that just a fun thing to do, or is that part of what you're trying to accomplish? It's definitely part of what we're trying to accomplish. The mission extends to their website, which actually promotes and recommends competing Chinese restaurants, ones that have inspired Schwartz. Drinking out of a panda? Because Mimi's secret sauce isn't a hidden ingredient. Wait, where else can you do that? But a certain vibe. For the step, feel free to take any photos or videos if we want. Used to generate fresh interest in ancient recipes. So the smacked cucumber. What does the smacking do? 
You'll see a lot of like crevices and cracks in there, which yeah. is where all the seasoning gets like trapped. People come to us and they're like, that's the best cucumber we've ever had. And we're like, there's a reason why people did this and it was like, okay, well, this makes sense and we should keep doing this, so. The best compliment that we can get is someone who lived in Sichuan and says, this brings me home, it tastes like home. That's what we, we wait for every night. And when it <laughs> happens, we can go to sleep and rest easy. You don't seem like an easy rester. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what makes you say that, but uh, I sleep pretty well. I have a different perspective, but, right. but that's just how our, our yeah. dynamic is. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Jeff Glor. We'll see you next time for another helping of The Dish.